Hello everybody, welcome to our first AP Calc video. Today we're going to be going over chapter P1 in our textbook, and that is going to be a review of pre-calculus topics. Now this video is going to move rather quickly through these objectives just because it is by definition a review and not necessarily a relearning. And a note on what I expect from you when you are following along with me here. I do expect that you are taking notes copiously. And I do expect that when I grade your notes and I take a look to see what you've done, that they closely match what I've written down in this video. If you would like to add extra things just to give yourself reminders, that is more than okay. I just would like to make it clear what the expectation is for success. So let's get started. Uh, just to let you know, you do not have to write down these objectives. That is the one exception of things you don't have to write down. Uh, these are just to guide us, let us know what we're going to be expecting in this video. So uh, we're going to go over sketching graphs, testing for symmetry, finding x and y intercepts, points of intersection, and what that means, and fitting models to data. So let's get started. First, we're going to talk about sketching graphs. Now, to sketch a graph, you have a few options. You can create a table, and that's also known as point plotting. Or you can find intercepts, or you can use parent functions and their transformations. Now, what we're going to focus on in this first example is just finding intercepts. Let's refresh that pretty quick. So, for example, say you are given the task to find all intercepts for the function y equals x cubed minus 16x. Well, you're going to be finding both your y-intercept and your x-intercepts. So remember, just in general, to find your y-intercept, that's when x equals 0. And to find your x-intercept, that's when y equals 0. So to find that x-intercept, let's do that one second. Let's start with our y-intercept here. Uh, to find our y-intercept, going to draw a little arrow and start that over here for you. We set y equals to 0 and we get x cubed minus 16x. Now we're going to do some of that factoring we learned back in Algebra 2 and we're going to take out an x and then we are going to be left with x squared minus 16, oh pardon me, just 16 inside the parentheses. If you remember your perfect squares factoring, then you'll remember that we can change this into x plus 4, x minus 4. Lastly, to get some values for x, we can use that zero product property, set each of these things equal to zero, and when we do that, we'll find that x equals zero, x would equal negative 4, and x would equal positive 4 if we solved all of those for zero. Awesome. However, I would like to stop us right here and let you know that this is not how we write our answer. In AP, we have to be very careful about how we report our answers. It is asking us the question to find all intercepts. So I do not report my values this way. I need to report them as intercepts, as coordinates. So I need to say this. My x-intercepts are at 0, 0 negative 4, 0, and at 4, 0. 
And now to deal with our uh, x-intercepts, Oh, I did that backwards. That's okay. I'm going to redo my arrow here. You guys can see I did my work a little back backwards there. That's okay. These are x-intercepts, so just move that arrow over. My mistake. First video. I'm sure I'll get better at working out all these kinks later. Okay, so we found our x-intercepts by plugging in 0 for y. Now let's find our y-intercepts. And we can just kind of do this one mentally, you guys. Check it out. If we were to take our original function and plug in 0 for x, wow, we would just get y equals 0. So right away, just doing some mental math, I can see that I would have a y-intercept at 0, 0, and that would be all. Okay, that's finding intercepts. Now, what if we were asked a different question? What if we were asked not to just find our intercepts, but to graph using intercepts? And our function was x minus y squared equal to 1. Well, we're going to start this off just the same. We're going to find those intercepts first. So, to begin, uh, let's start with our x-intercept. And remember, as we just reviewed, set y equal to 0. Hey, that's not so bad. x would equal 1. So I would have a, an x-intercept at 1, 0. Awesome. If I was going to find a y-intercept, then I would need to set that x equal to 0, and I would be left with the equation negative y squared equals 1. From here, I can transfer that negative over, so I have y squared equals negative 1. I can take the square root of both sides. And when I do that, you may have recognized this as our i plus or minus square root of negative 1 is not a real number. That is an imaginary number. And when you get a result like that, remember that when we are graphing, we are graphing in the real coordinate plane. So what this essentially means is that there are no y-intercepts. Okay, so I know two things right now. I know there are no y-intercepts, and I know I have a point at 1, 0. And quite frankly, that doesn't give me a lot of information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up to my toolbox here, create a table, find intercepts, or use parent functions, and I'm going to use that parent function to help me out here. And in order to get that parent function, I'm going to take my original and I'm going to solve it for y so I can really see what I'm dealing with here. So if I were to first start solving for y, I would move that x over and I would get negative y squared equals negative x plus 1. I would change the sign of everything or multiply everything by negative 1 and I would get y squared equals x minus 1. I would take the square root of both sides, and I would get y equals radical x minus 1. Oh, okay. And now when I look at this, I can clearly see a parent function here. I can see the parent function of y equals the square root of x. Now, I know that that is just that sideways parabola looking thing, and I know that it has the translation of moving to the right by 1. And that means it's going to pass through that point, 1, 0. Great. Now I have all the information I need to sketch a graph, so I'm going to do just that. Get my coordinate plane here going. And now I'm going to have that point at 1, 0. And I know my parent function looks like that sideways parabola. So there we have it. We have graphed using intercepts. Okay, moving on to our next objective. Oh, 
Looks like my computer froze out on me, but I think we're all good. Okay. So our next objective was testing for symmetry. Let me just write that right here real quick. Testing for symmetry. And to review, there are the three basic types. There is symmetry about the x-axis. There is symmetry about the y-axis. And there is symmetry about the origin. Now, to give you a graphic example of what that means, something that's symmetric about the x-axis is kind of like we just saw, something that for every x value, it has a positive and negative y value. And something that is symmetric about the y-axis, graphically, we can just think of that plain old parabola, right? The classic one we're used to seeing, where for all of our y values, there is a positive and a negative x value. And you can see that they reflect each other. Reflection over the y, reflection over the x. About the origin is just a little bit different. It's sort of like we combine both of those concepts. And something that would be symmetric about the origin could look like a cubic function, something that looks like this, where if you were to take any point from this side and reflect it 180 degrees, you would get a point over here. And you can also see that relationship of a positive xy, negative xy. Now, what you can do in order to find if a function is symmetric about any of these things, you can just plug in different values into the function in order to test it out. Uh, so say that every positive y, you would substitute in a negative y. And if it's the same, then it is symmetric, right? And over here, if you replaced every x, every positive x, with a negative x, and you get the same, I should say function, same function, then yes, it's symmetric about the y-axis. Over here, if you do both things, if you replace all the positive x's with negative x's and all the positive y's with negative y's, and you result in the same function, then it is also symmetric about the origin. So let's do an example of this. Say we were given the function y equals x squared over x squared plus 1. Let's see if this is symmetric about the x-axis. Let's replace this y with a negative y and see if we get the same function. we would get negative y equals x squared over x squared plus 1. Now, it's just a simple matter of asking yourself, is this the same as this? Well, no. So it is not symmetric about the x-axis. Not symmetric about the x-axis. Okay. Now, we're going to replace every x with a negative x to see if it's symmetric about the y-axis. And when we do that, it's going to look like this. And now, we're pretty comfortable with the rules of exponents here. Any negative times itself is just going to be a positive again. So, what we have here and here are essentially the same function. So this is symmetric. Oh, I'm missing an M. Okay. 
about the y-axis. Lastly, uh, let's see if it's symmetric about the origin by replacing y with negative y and x with negative x. Negative y equals negative x squared over negative x squared plus 1. Well, again, we run into that same problem where we end up getting negative y x squared x squared plus 1. And this is not the same as what we started with, right? Here's our original. And this is only equivalent here, not here, not here. So we know it is not symmetric about the origin as well. And if we really want to get in the habit of answering the way that we are expected to on the AP exam, uh, then we would go a step further here and we would fully state that the function, and you state your function, y equals x squared over x squared plus 1 is symmetric about the y axis. Okay. And that is just a quick review of symmetry. Next, we're going to talk about those points of intersection. Points of intersection. Now, you may remember points of intersection also as systems of equations, right? Uh, the same as solving systems of equations, because that's all a point of intersection is, correct? A point of intersection is simply a solution to an equation. And so, or pardon me, it's the point where two equations intersect, so if we solve both of them, we will find the point where they cross each other. There's a really a lot of ways you can do this. Uh, your book gives you a really good example of substitution if you would like to see an example of that again. I'm going to go through the process of elimination. So, say we are given the system. We are asked to little example here, okay. Um, find the points of intersection for the system and then we are given two equations x squared minus y equals 3 and x minus y equals 1. Now the elimination strategy tells you to eliminate one of your variables by making them opposites. And it looks like we've got this single variable y here that would be pretty easy to eliminate if we set one of these, uh, multiplied one of these by negative 1. So if we were to do that, if we were to multiply the bottom by negative 1, then what we would get, our system would now look like this. I should put some parentheses here. We'd still have our x squared minus y equals 3 because we didn't do anything to that. And on the bottom, we would have negative x plus y equals negative 1. Now, we can just do some basic algebra here. We can see that our positive and our negative y's would cancel out. Our x squared minus x really can't be simplified. And 3 minus 1 would get us that 2. And now we can see pretty clearly by this x squared we're going to be dealing with a quadratic function. And so we can start to move our 2 over. Set it equal to 0. Do that lovely factoring that we got so used to in Algebra 2. Where we have x and we have minus 2 and we have plus 1. And again, if we do the zero product property, 
then we know that we have two answers for x. We've got x equals 2 and x equals negative 1. Awesome, I have found some values for x. However, we are asked to solve a system and we're trying to find points of intersection. Right now we've only found the x. This is what we've truly found. We found two points and we found our x coordinates for those two points. We are still missing the y's. Now to fill in these blank spots here to find the y values, we got one more thing to do. We have to take these x values and plug them back into one of our two originals. I don't know about you, but this bottom one looks a lot easier to plug into. So I'm going to do that. Uh, now what we're going to have is we're going to have for one case 2 minus y equals 1 and for another we're going to have negative 1 minus y equals 1. And if we were just to do some mental math here, you guys, uh, we could see that we would subtract 2 on both sides. We would get negative 1. We would get negative y equals negative 1, which would just end up getting us a positive 1. Now, when x equals negative 1, to sol start solving it, we would add 1 to both sides. We would get negative y equals 2. We would move that negative over, and we would get negative 2 when x equals negative 1. And those would be our two points of intersection. And make sure there's a comma between those points uh, or space because you are not multiplying those two things together. They are just coordinates. Okay. Now, let's move on to our last objective, find, uh, fitting a model to data. So let's move on down here. Now, when you are asked to fit a model to data, you're typically given uh, some information. You're given either a table or a graph or a set of points, and then you are asked to find a model. And remember, the word model, you guys, is just an equation that fits given data. And the example that we're going to talk about, uh, we're given data. Oh, pardon me. Uh, we're going to find a model, but then it's also important that you understand we don't just stop there. We're not just done when we find our model. We typically are asked to make a prediction. And that makes sense uh, because it doesn't really matter that we found a model or an equation unless we use it somehow. So uh, for this given example, our data is going to be dealing in a number of cell phone sites in the U.S. And we are given the following table. In terms of years and number of sites. And let's get all the spaces that we need here, probably about six of them. Okay. In 2003, there were 163 sites. 2005, 184. Oh, 2000, not 205. 2007, there were 213. 2009, there were 247. Uh, 2011, there were 283, and 2013, there were 304. Now, we're going to need to find a model. And this particular question tells us to find a model of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. 
Oh, pardon me, this is t, not x. There we go, we're dealing in terms of time, t. Okay, and you can see then that the type of model we're going to be finding is not linear. The type of model we're going to be finding is quadratic. And there's another important piece of information that they tell us. They tell us also that t is equal to 3 in 2003. That's very important. What they're telling us to do there is to change our table. We are no longer dealing in terms of 2000s. We're going to deal in terms of much smaller numbers. So instead of writing out 2003, I'm going to manipulate this table and I'm going to change it according to what they gave me. And it looks like they're dealing in number of years since 2000. So we just fill in our numbers accordingly. Okay. Now we have all of our values for t and all of our dependent values on the bottom. So what we are going to be doing next is we're going to be reviewing a bit here on our calculator. I'll try and keep this as clear as I can. Okay. Uh, your calculator is going to be a really big help here. If I go through the instructions pretty quickly, don't worry. I will be giving you guys a handout in class uh, to guide you on your own uh, calculators. So, uh, first of all, what we're going to need to do are some memory clearances. So we're going to press second. And then maybe just let me zoom out a little bit more here. There we go, that's better. All right, we're going to press second and then memory down here. And we're going to go down to where it tells us to clear all lists. Press enter. OK, now all of our lists are cleared out. Wonderful. Uh, next, we're going to set up our stat plot. So we're going to press second, stat plot. And we're going to make sure this first one is turned on. So we're going to press enter. Make sure it says on, press enter. And here's what it's telling us. It's telling us that we're going to be plotting a uh, scatter plot of points, not a line or a bar graph. And it's telling us that our independent variables are going to be in our list one. Zoom that in a little bit more. Oh. Hang on. Got some technical difficulties here. There we go. Okay, zooming in. There we go. I can see that a little bit better. So we have our L1, our L2 for our Y, for our dependent. And our marks are going to be these open boxes, and it's going to be in the color blue. Now, your calculators in class might not do all these colors, but the purpose will be the same. Okay, now that we've got all that set up, we can press second, quit. And we're going to perform our regression. We know that they wanted us to perform a quadratic regression. Uh, but before we need to do that, we need to put in our data. So we're going to press stat, we're going to press edit, and we're going to put in our data. So for our x's, our independents, that's going to be our, our t's, our years. So we're going to do 357911 and oh, 11 and 13. Now for our y's, we're going to have 163, 184, 213, 247, 283, and 304. Awesome. And everything is where it needs to be. And so now we go back to stat, and we're going to press calc. And underneath calc, we're going to go to where it says quad reg. And quad reg, as you might have guessed, just means that quadratic regression, and that's what we need. So we're going to press enter. And our x list, yep, that's what we need. Our x's are our l1s, our y's are our l2s. And then right here where it says store your regression equation, you're going to want to do that. So you're going to want to store it in your first, in your y1. And you can do that pretty quickly by pressing alpha, trace, and where it says Y1, press enter. 
and now we're going to press calculate. All right, so now we've got some good information here in the form ax squared plus bx plus c. We know that our equation is going to look like this. It's going to be 0.125x squared plus 12.8x plus 120.475. And there was also an important number there. They gave us our r squared, which is 0 0.99396. And remember, if we take the square root of that, that is how we get our correlation coefficient. And basically, that's just going to tell us how closely our model is to our actual data. Okay. And when we take the square root of that, we get 0 0.99698. Okay, that's our correlation coefficient. And you can see this is pretty close to our original data. If you think about multiplying something by 1 by itself, you get exactly the same thing. So if we're multiplying our data by this, by 0.99698, that's pretty close to 1, so it's pretty close to what our function actually is. Pretty close to our data. And this is great. We've found our model. We have found uh, how close it is to our uh, original data. But then we're going to make that prediction like we talked about before. We're going to predict the number of cell phone sites in 2025. Okay, and check it out. 2025, we're not interested in 2025. We're manipulating our independent variable, correct, like they told us to. So we're not interested in this value. We're interested when t is 25, right? So what we can do is we can go back to our calculators and we can graph this and then calculate our value. So first we're going to press graph and there you can see that these original boxes are our points from the table, and this line is that model. This line is that quadratic model that we made. Awesome. So now what we need to do is find that value when t equals 25. So we can press second, trace, so we get the calc function, and we press one for value. We want to know when x equals 25. And it tells us right there, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see a little bit better, kind of small. It tells us when x equals 25, y equals 518.6. Awesome. So when we're writing down our answer, we say 518.6. But again, when we're in AP, we're very careful about how we report our information. So we say 518.6. cell phone sites. And that is uh, just a review of those topics. Thanks for watching our first video and I'll see you guys in class.